Uh, good evening, and welcome to tonight's lecture. I'm Richard Sommer, the Dean of the Daniels Faculty, and I'm pleased to introduce tonight's featured speaker, Belinda Tato. So each year, the Jeffrey Cook Memorial Tr Lecture is presented at both the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design, and at the University of Manitoba's Faculty of Architecture, Ta thanks to the support from the Jeffrey Cook Charitable Trust. Over the years, the support has made it possible for us to bring internationally acclaimed architects and other designers to the faculty as part of our, part of our evening lecture series. The Jeffrey Cook Charitable Trust was established in 2005 to pay tribute to the late Professor Jeffrey Ross Cook, who was born in Canada and studied architecture at the University of Manitoba. I should add that the Je Je Jeffrey Cook Charitable Trust is also generously funding student travel opportunities here at the Daniels faculty, as well as research on sustainable design approaches and more recently, uh, re uh, sustainable design approaches to our new project at One Spadina uh, Crescent. So we are, uh, we are very uh, grateful to the Cook Charitable Trust. Jeffrey Ross Cook was a registered architect, a member of the American Institute of Architects, an elected member of the International Committee of Architectural Critics, and an honorary fellow of the RIBA in London. He was widely acknowledged as one of the pioneers of solar and biclimatic bi design. He ran a master's course on solar energy design at the Arizona State University, which due to his international reputation and dedication as a teacher, attracted students from temperate, I don't actually know if this is the right word, was it from temperate or intemperate climates from all over the world, but uh, students who, who were coming from countries that also uh, had a lot to benefit from understanding these at the, at the time, very nascent technologies were, were um, drawn to his, his course. So I want to especially uh, ask you to join me in thanking Professor Emeritus Klaus Dunker and Mariut Dunker, trustees of the Jeffrey Cook Charitable Trust. Klaus is a Professor Emeritus of this faculty, uh, and that's one of our connections to the trust. Uh, and they are the principals of Dunker and Associates, an architecture and planning firm. Uh, they're here tonight and they're really very much responsible for making a lot of this happen. So thank you, Klaus and Marius. Now, tonight's featured speaker, Belinda Tato, is from the Madrid-based firm Ecosistema Urbano, which she founded in the year 2000 with her partner, Jose Luis Vallejo. Ecosistema, Ecosistema Urbano operates across the fields of urbanism. I think it's all being explained here behind me, so, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain it anyway. Um, they operate across the fields of urbanism, architecture, engineering, and sociology. Their approach has been to rethink urban design as a social and ecological art. As designers, they're committed to creating environments and spaces that grow out of the dynamic, self-organizing capacity of everyday citizens. They aim to use design, and especially new modes of visualizing urban systems, to inspire social interaction within communities and strengthen a community's relationship with the, with the environment. This is, of course, something we are very interested in here at the Daniels faculty. It is something that is really uh, uh, essential to the mission of the, the Cook Charitable Trust lecture. And now, Belinda uh, and Ecosystem at Rubeno do not use the term actually, they don't really use the term landscape architecture. Yet with their sophisticated way of reading and projecting the built environment as a number of nested, at a number of nested scales, they're really working in a, in a more than 100 year old tradition now of landscape architecture as a form of ecological planning. Albeit they bring the architects interested in, in built, built systems uh, into the mix. Like many of the most innovative offices working in this realm today, they consciously consider the built form of the urbanized environment to be uh, subject to and often actually driven by digital processes and web-based interfaces. They use, the, so it's, it's curious and they use th this rather now old-fashioned term placemaking, uh, which is a, a primary interest of theirs, but they know that our engagement with places is affected by ubiquitous technologies that, we're, that we both hold in our hands 
and uh, other technologies that we use to manage large-scale infrastructural processes involving energy transmission and transport. So it's really this new idea of, um, of real physical networks that deal with problems of energy and water, and then the electronic networks we use to both build community and do planning for these things that a firm like this is really trying to put their mind around. Ecosystema Ur Urbano has used this philosophy of marrying the local and the physical to the virtual on the network base to design and implement projects in Norway, Denmark, Spain, Italy, France, and China. They are currently working on several urban proposals for different cities, including the design for an experimental urban playground uh, in Dordrecht, Holland, the e Ecopolis Plaza, a waste to resources building on the outskirts of Madrid, a network design project for the future of the main public space in Hamar, Norway, and the design for a new experimental educational center for the Reggio Children's Foundation in Reggio Emilia, Italy. Belinda uh, Tacho and our colleagues have received more than 30 awards in national and international design competitions, including the Architectural Association and the Environments, Ecology, and Sustainability Research Cluster Award in 2006, an Architectural Review Award for Emerging Architecture in London in 2007, and the Silver Award from the Wholesome Foundation for Sustainable Construction in 2009. The work the firm's work has also been widely covered in national and international media and exhibited in multiple galleries, museums, and institutions. Belinda is very active as a teacher and as a, as, a, as a leader of workshops, both in Spain and internationally, and has been a visiting professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design over the last few years. Now, aside from speaking in Manitoba last night, at Manitoba, in Winnipeg, this is, her, uh, this is now her second uh, speaking engagement in Canada. But I just found out in speaking with her briefly that um, this is not her first time visiting Canada because she was an exchange student when you were in high school uh, in, in Nova Scotia? No. In Newfoundland. So this is her second return to Canada. Uh, she had a, a very different experience than the one she's probably having in Newfoundland uh, a, new, uh, 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 a number of years ago. So please welcome and, uh, me and joining her. Uh, welcome. Belinda to Toronto and to, the, and, and to the Daniels faculty. Well, thank you for the beautiful introduction. I would love to explain my work in the, in, with those words. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. And as he was saying, uh, it's very moving because I really was here for one year. And I actually visited Toronto and Montreal and many other places in Canada, and that was 25 years ago, which is a long time. So it's very nice to be back. <coughs> uh, well, uh, I'm going to speak about the work uh, that we produce at Ecosystema Urbano. <coughs> we like to, to call ourselves, instead of urban designers, urban social designers. I studied both architecture in, uh, in Madrid and in London and uh, during the 90s. And during the 90s, all the focus and all the emphasis was put in the originality, on the geometry, and our, you know, our ideas. We were supposed to be the best uh, in creating new ideas. And there was very little mention about the people. So all the design was focused on figures, shapes, and geometries, but nobody ever mentioned about the people, about the happiness, about uh, you know, the social part. So that's why we really jumped into calling ourselves urban social designers instead of urban designers. And the three ingredients that we work and include in every single project we produce are these three, social, technology, and environment. And combined in different ways, depending on the nature of the project, that's what actually brings in uh, including our solutions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the projects that we have produced in the last few years, and they are organized around different categories. <coughs> the first one would be transforming the existing. We very much enjoy to work into the e existing urban tissue. And this is a project in the outer skirts of Madrid. This is uh, the Eco Boulevard project. And the city of Madrid has grown a lot. All these yellow areas are new developments in the last few years, and there is this red area, which is a, a new development for 26,000 housing units, which is a lot. So the kind of urbanism that has been taking place is very little interesting. It's usually the very same block repeated all over the place, ignoring completely the conditions of topography, orientation, and so on. <coughs> so there was a department within the city of Madrid who was concerned about this kind of urban planning that we're doing, or they're doing, 
and in which they also emphasize this idea of moving by car because all the shopping and all the commercial and economic activity is placed in one spot. So you really have a kind of encourage to use the car for your everyday kind of moving around the, ci the city, which is very little Mediterranean. So the competition was to give ideas for this 550 meters long <coughs> and 50 meters wide boulevard. <coughs> we had to provide some kind of public space there, quality public space, and we like this image as a paradigm of a, pub of a functioning and well-performing public space, which is Yemalevna in Marrakesh in Morocco, because it's just uh, an asphalt surface which is flexible enough to allow any kind of activity during both day and night. <coughs> but we also had to provide some kind of bi bioclimatic conditioning because the summer is very, very tough in Madrid. I know here is probably oh, the winter, the winter is an issue, but over there is the summer and it's really difficult to get people out of their homes because if you don't have this quality public space, it's very uncomfortable. So we realized that the best way to provide this climatic comfort would be by planting many trees because the trees are efficient all through the year and they can be very you know, uh, perfect, they even purify the air. The only problems with the trees is that it takes a few years until they're really grown to provide this comfort. So we thought that our goal here was to provide a kind of a temporary solution until the real trees were completely grown. So these are images from the competition. <coughs> we found inspiration in this traditional East, uh, uh, Middle East architecture in which the air goes in through the tower, goes in through wet material so it gets fresher, creating a microclimate inside the building. So with that same principle, we designed this structure with these cooling towers in the perimeter <coughs> in which the air goes into the structure, gets in contact with the water atomizers, and therefore it gets cooler, heavier, and it provides a microclimate at the ground level. <coughs> Excuse me. So with that solution, we designed this basic structure that will be the same for the three different ones, and according to the different elements we put into it, we characterize these three different air trees, as we call them. So the first one was the air tree, then the playground tree, and then the media tree. The idea was to work with low-tech elements because we don't have the labs to test or to invent new systems. We really had to rely on those systems that are already there in the market, so it's, everything is off the shelf, and, and we basically use these cooling systems that is very much used in the greenhouse industry in the south of Spain. Another important idea was to kind of give a solution for the energy efficiency. It would be a problem if we design such a sophisticated urban furniture that, uh, and, and, and expect the city to have the, m the money to maintain it. So um, there is a law in Spain that forces the electrical companies to buy the electricity produced by alternative means as much as five times their selling price. So we're producing energy, selling it to the network, and buying the energy we need again from the network, and we're making a profit of about 8,000 euros per structure per year that can be reinvested in this maintenance. So the idea that the maintainer should be very low cost, low tech, so that a plumber and a gardener should be able to fix all the elements. So these are images. The inside wall is a green wall, and depending on the different orientations, we have different species. And we also like, uh, well, the, the lighting is LED lighting, and we also like to, to emphasize this idea of sustainability as education, because we think that's the most sustainable we can do, like working with the future generations mainly for having a better future. So in every sense, we try to incorporate uh, as many recycled or recyclable materials as possible. And in this case, the, the flooring is out of recycled tires from the cars, and then the benches are recycled plastic bars, and again, this is not so important because in the end, this is a very small project in a, in a city like Madrid, but it is important to, to, to send the message out and to let people know. So this is how the street looked before the intervention. Here you can see the shadow that uh, these trees are projecting. It's very, very poor. And this is a parking lane, two driving lanes, another parking lane, a little pedestrian area, and then the same scheme on the other side. So this, the street is very wide and very little appealing. So here you can see how we cancel some of the parking lanes in order to give more space for pedestrian and for people. And these are interior features, outside features. The LED lighting can be programmed second by second all through the year and the idea was to provide this kind of landmark into this landscape which is very bland. So 
this is how the street looks now. This used to be the sidewalk and we didn't demolish it because it didn't make any sense. We just pre-leveled with the rest of the pavement and here the parking lane and the driving lanes and these are also the original benches. As designers, we would have never chosen those, but they were there and they were new and it didn't make any sense to get rid of them, so we just relocated them in a different way. So this is a crossroad. So it used to be a crossroad and now it's a public space and it's very kind of successfully, successful, especially in summertime because it's kind of cool. And this is the media tree. The idea here was to create a kind of a gathering space for TV shows or TV, you know, soccer games or whatever. <coughs> and the, the helicoidal ramp is allowing this, uh, to, you know, universal accessibility for the inside space. This is a picture when they were testing the water system. This was in winter because, you know, they had to finish the work and they had to test it. And that's why you can see the water so much. Otherwise, it would be almost invisible because in the summer, the air is extremely dry. So the water disappears right away. And these are pictures of how it has been used for many different kind of events and users. And this is an animation about the concept. has become a very kind of popular landmark and it's, it's, it's also nice to see the, the, the consequences of it because it's a, it's a neighborhood that nobody would ever go to, I mean, as a tourist. And now there's, you know, there's always some architecture group visiting not only this project but some other kind of interesting actions in the area. So it has become very trendy in, in that aspect. <coughs> okay, this is a project related to the crisis. I don't know if you heard about it, but we have a little bit of a crisis in Europe and, uh, and also <laughs> in Spain. And so we got a call from, um, from a multinational company who owns shopping malls all over Europe, especially uh, in Spain and Italy. And they're really kind of struggling now. And they really kind of blame the economy or the crisis. It's like, yeah, this is, you know, it's because of the crisis. But it's, it's, we were kind of shocked about that because, you know, we feel they made so much money so easily for so many years that it's very difficult for them to think in a different model, which is shocking. Uh, yeah. So we, they were calling us just to design a new facade for one of their buildings, which is really struggling in, in outside of Barcelona. And it is a struggling because, of course, there's many other, you know, there's a few, a whole bunch of new shopping malls in the area which are competing, you know, because, of course, there's less money, but also there's more confidence. So um, the first, as a first approach, we just Google shopping mall, uh, and then you really can see that, I mean, we, 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 we had that idea in, before anyway, you really can see that any shopping mall all over the world, they give you the very same experience. It's usually the very same atmosphere, lighting, food, even clothes. So it's very kind of predictable experience and there's nothing really relevant or you know, it doesn't make any difference to go here uh, in, in America or in Asia or in Europe. So the first question was like, can we really bring a kind of a new experience into the, the existing shopping mall? So the idea was to reprogram it, to bring some, some other activity into it. So we brainstormed a little bit and we thought that maybe this shopping mall should be combined with some other kind of uh, topics or programs. So as physical activity or playground or creativity and culture, new technologies, gastronomy, networking, and, and everything else. So instead of having just a shopping experience, you would actually have a kind of an added value uh, and shopping experience as a consequence. So here there are some kind of attempts of trying to explain this idea that it was not the facade should actually reflect whatever is happening for you in that building so if we were really reprogramming it for an, a sports or a physical activity the facade could be a climbing wall or if it is a playground it should really be a, a playground inside <coughs> or a culture and mm, uh, interface like an outdoor cinema in the facade or a technology interface or in the gastronomy case it would be a facade in which you actually grow the vegetables and the species that you can serve inside the building. So it should be kind of a different, yeah, uh, a, a kind of a, a more deep uh, development and not just a facade issue. So this, the next uh, group of projects is uh, about designing responsive urban environments. 
we were asked by the city of Madrid um, to design a kind of a, a 2.0 version of the Vallecas project, and this was uh, to be in the international exhibition in Shanghai in 2010. So I guess you know, but uh, all the international exhibitions and expos and everything else are becoming really, really dull. Or I don't know if that's the word. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're not very, li they're, they're very little interesting. I, I guess when they started, uh, they were, you know, they were very important events in which countries and cities share their knowledge and in science, botanics, you know, their findings. It was something very, you know, very important. But right now they're just touristic experiences and they're very little, yeah, interesting. So there was a huge effort, as in every other expo, to do very sexy pavilions, and of course they were. But nobody seemed to care very much about the public space. And even if the motto was uh, better cities, better lives, you could actually see that people were exhausted because uh, the expo takes place in summertime, which is extremely hot and humid. And it was very, very uncomfortable. And people would, <laughs> yeah, everybody was kind of carrying their own chair because they were really suffering from the expo. So it was not a very pleasant experience. And so we started to work with the engineers trying to figure out how to, you know, to provide a kind of more comfortable outside space because that was our commission to, to provide, design the, the outside space. <coughs> and we did, or they did some simulations about it and this is the final thing. This is the Madrid pavilion and this is the, the, the design by FOA and this is the, the design that we did. And the idea was to provide this kind of element that could work both day and night and could actually be connected real time with the climatic sensors and, you know, depending on the conditions, you could configure it in different ways. So there is three layers. The first one is, the, the inside one is a projection layer, then there is a darkening layer, and then it's a, a sunscreen. So depending on how you use it, how you use it, it can become very transparent and translucent or opaque and so on. So we also had this, um, seven meter diameter uh, fan and that was, this was a test that was hanging from the structure and the video is speeded up, okay? This was not the real speed. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise it would be a hair dryer. <laughs> well, the idea was in order to control very much the electrical consumption of it, the, the idea is to, to keep always the same uh, speed of the fan. So you actually just bring it down and closer to the ground or farther up, depending on the climatic conditions and the amount of people that was gathering there. So here you can see we also work with LED lighting to provide these different kind of um, uh, atmospheres. Uh, we also designed these wind generators together with their engineers. And, you know, I always say the same joke, but I find it very funny. And then that is that they were completely designed and, and they were designed and fabricated and produced and, uh, in Spain and then shipped to China. And I, I like to say that probably it was the only thing shipped to China and not the other way around that year <laughs> because everything is the other way around. And here are some other events and uses. And this is the news when they were presenting the, the opening of the expo. So the idea was to use these wind generators because even if the speed of the wind in Shanghai is not that high, but, the, but it's uh, very constant, it's, there's always this amount of wind. just to see a little bit. Okay, together with this element, we have to provide some kind of furniture that people could use and manipulate and uh, to use in many different ways. So we designed these elements that can be assembled <coughs> and put together in different ways. And people uh, enjoyed it. 
Okay, this is a small project uh, also dealing with, um, with, yeah, with the sustainability in a kind of a playful way and uh, it is um, a competition we won. Uh, they were calling for ideas for uh, unconventional play objects and we thought that uh, again, you know, talking about sustainability, we want to do this kind of teaching or learning in a very playful and pleasant way. So we designed this uh, carousel that with the amount uh, of movement produced by the kids playing with it during the day, you are producing energy and storing it for the lighting during the night. So it has just been finished and these are the images of it. It's very funny because it's very, to design a playground is extremely difficult. Uh, I guess it's also over here, but uh, in Europe it's like uh, all the European regulations and it's extremely restrictive and you have to prove that everything is going to be fine, but then kids make so crazy things, you know, that really, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, you cannot uh, just guarantee that they're not going to behave like this. So it was very shocking to see this. <laughs> then the, the next uh, is raising environmental awareness. Uh, this is a project in the outer skirts of Madrid. Uh, this is a suburban area in which everyone has got their own swimming pool, so they don't have to share. And this is the the street uh, view, uh, so as you can see, the, the public space is not that exciting. So they were, they, they wanted to do a kindergarten in this industrial site, which is not a former industrial site, it's an existing industri industrial site. So it was a bit shocking to think that they, they would be, you know, very, very small kids and babies in this area, which is kind of, uh, there's a lot of traffic around and pollution and noise, of course. So the first operation was to work with the topography in order to create or to provide a kind of a shelter or buffer area where they could be kind of safe and disconnected from the, from the outside. And also working with, this, with these sustainability issues, of course the building had to be class A energy efficient because that's the way any building has to be today. But also we wanted to make that visible and work with the water as well because water is a big issue in Spain. So we are mm, recycling and purifying all the waste waters from the building, not only the gray waters, but also the black waters in a macrophyte lagoon just in front of it so that this water afterwards can be used for the irrigation of the park or the, 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 the green area. So these are images of the process here. You can see as how we work with the topography. And uh, it was also the idea of creating a public space, a very powerful public space in front of the building because we assume and we know that people over there in these suburban areas are just, you know, leaving the kids in the morning and picking them up from the car. And we wanted to make sure that they really have to stop the car and enter the building. So they have to go through the public space and we want to make to guarantee that there's a kind of a social hub linked to the, to the public school. So the public space has become very popular and up to the point that actually during the weekends, even people come there, even if, if the site is an industrial site, which is not so cool. So here you can see there's, you know, big slides and this is a small video. Uh, showing a little bit how it works. So the idea of integrating this macrophyte lagoon in the visible area was because we wanted to make sure that not only the people, you know, in the city, I mean, in the city hall or in the building was aware about this, you know, recycling system, but also anyone passing by would be aware about. So uh, after this project, we, we teamed up with the company who was, um, who is doing this kind of projects, like implementing them all over the world. To, to enter the Buckminster Fuller Challenge, which is a, uh, a competition that uh, aims to, you know, to, to award uh, good ideas for improving the lives of people. 
So again, as we realized that and we presented that the water is a very important issue in the south of Europe and, uh, and of course in Spain, we, we provided this idea of um, implementing this solution in kind of leftover spaces in the, in the city and also um, deprived areas. So it brings not only landscape or sustainable value, but also a community value because it, it, it connects people. So these are some images of how to integrate that into the roundabouts because there's a lot of them over there which are kind of empty. Um, another project that is kind of integrating the sustainability uh, in the, as, as an with, with an educational approach, this is a competition we recently won and we are just uh, developing the construction kind of part. It's, um, it's a building for the Reggio Children Foundation in the city of Reggio Emilia, which is a city who has um, um, put a lot of efforts and resources in order to create a very good quality public education system. So they're doing a new building and the idea was to, of course, again, you know, to do a sustainable and efficient building because that's the way it has to be, but also trying to make the kids working and, and studying in that space aware about it. And there are some mechanical systems that in, involve the kids in the functioning of the building for both summer and winter. I'm not going into the details. Uh, this, this is another project dealing with water. Uh, there is a new industrial development outside of, of Madrid and the idea was instead of getting rid of the rainwater and just sending it to the drainage system, the idea or the switch system, the idea was to deal with that rainwater as, as a value and not as a waste and try to bring, to bring it, I mean, to, to deal with it locally, creating a, a rainwater park. So depending on the amount of water you have during the summer and the winter, you have different kind of landscapes and the whole water park is designed based upon the idea of purification and how, how to deal with that water for the irrigation of the park itself. This is also a project for the city of Madrid. This was also a competition and the idea of the competition was um, you know, they have a, a building from the 1850 and they want to create a kind of an environmental museum. So the competition was not only to give the architectural solution for it, but also to kind of develop the idea or the conceptual functioning of the building. So we thought that instead of having a museum, which is a kind of a contemplative experience, it should be a something more active, engaging the people in different ways. So the building should be attractive and interesting, not only for the locals, not only for the tourists, but for everyone in different ways. So we produced this video as a way to visualize in the different potential users and how would they find about this project and how they could be active about it. So it starts with this teacher who finds out and then she arrives to school and tells the kids and everything else. <laughs> Okay, I can move on, right? Because <laughs> okay, collaborative placemaking. Uh, we were invited to, to be part in an exhibition at the Louisiana Museum in Denmark. Um, it's a beautiful museum by the water, and it's, uh, it's a kind of the perfect plan, plan for the families over there because it's really kind of a children welcoming place, and it's very nice. So the, the, the exhibition was about green cities or green architecture future and we were assigned a space and our, you know, we called our, our project What If Cities because the idea was not only to give our own ideas, I mean Ecosystem Urbanos ideas, but also to kind of open up for everybody's contributions somehow. So we did both the physical exhibition and the digital exhibition and we were collecting ideas from everyone in the world who wanted to participate and exhibiting them at real time in the exhibition. So these are some images of the, the space and some snapshots from, from the website. So we collected, uh, you know, um, a couple of hundreds of ideas. But at that point we realized that uh, there was a kind of a, a missing uh, bridge between citizens and cities and there was no such an efficient way to communicate ideas. So if I am a, 
if I am a citizen and I have a great idea or I have a very terrible problem in my, in my street or in my neighborhood, there wasn't this kind of uh, yeah, communication channel. So we started to work on this platform, which is the What If Cities platform. And the idea was to create this very intuitive and simple way of introducing both your ideas or your problems in you know, either color and georeference them in the map. And so then you could actually visualize in a very simple way. Uh, so this is a few years ago when there was no Twitter and there was not so many other things that, uh, that has been happening lately and that are, they're great. And uh, it was implemented in different cities in Europe and now it's an, uh, an open source um, tool that anyone can download both the website and also the mobile app for their own purposes. So from time to time we get you know, emails from people in different places of the world that they're using it for, for their own purposes. So we have this digital part, we, we keep it like very kind of uh, active and we, this is also a, a small project uh, for the museums night uh, in Madrid and we thought that instead of having an adults activity it would be nice to have also a children's activity because they're also citizens in the city. So the idea was to have a toys and book exchange party. So they, they, in order to come up they have to pay with an old toy and then they could choose something else. So it was a very successful uh, night, it was a whole weekend actually, but the whole idea was to launch this website which is lanochedelosniños.org and the idea is that kids can upload the pictures of those toys that they don't want anymore and they can find something they, they, you know, they like better and the, the whole idea is to, you know, to create new connections and to meet new friends in your own city. So again, we have different tools, uh, always for kind of social purposes, because we really believe, you know, technology is great because it really makes us closer and it provides us many more possibilities to connect in many different ways. So we have developing, for instance, our blog for six years now, and it has been very, it has become a very kind of relevant information hub for sustainable cities uh, information, <coughs> and we have some others. And this is the last category, empowering community through network design. The project is Dream Your City. Uh, this was a competition launched by the city of Hamar in the north of Oslo. And the competition was launched in order to look for new ideas of an art intervention in the public space. So we entered the competition, but we said instead of having a single mind thinking about a great idea, like an art piece, why don't we do something like with the community? So the art piece intervention is actually the, you know, the, this community work in order to, to come up and brainstorm for ideas for the square. So this is the video we presented for the competition. <coughs> And we call the proposal 1,000 square because the idea was not only to have one idea for the square but 1,000. And the idea was not only to work with the local community, but also to find new ways of engaging an international community that could be potentially interested in providing ideas for the square.
So that was uh, what we delivered. This was one video and one document. So then we won the competition because they thought it was the most interesting one. But uh, I don't know if you are familiar with, but uh, you should, that uh, winning a competition doesn't kind of directly connect with a commission, which is a kind of shocking when you learn about it. So there was a kind of a time in between uh, in which we had to convince the political board because they were a bit suspicious about having a participation process in such a long period of time. We were proposing, you know, instead of putting all the money in an art intervention, why do we split up that budget available into a series of workshops, seminars, activities, engaging different people for one year and a half. Uh, so these are, you know, pieces of the document we provided and, and the different activities we kind of envision and the different kind of stakeholders would be engaged with every activity. And this is the calendar we provided. So uh, in the end, we kind of uh, discussed possibilities and they didn't want such a long process. So we ended up shortening it up. And the name of the project was called Dream Hammer. And the idea was to have, you know, also a participation process, but it would only be like four months. And before that, we had to deliver a preliminary design because they wanted to see our design skills. And after the participation process, we would collect all that information and produce a final um, urban design for the square, okay? So this is what we actually got as a commission. And this is also a video that, uh, as you can see here, this is the model of the square that we produce, and this is the video that is going to tell a little bit about the history of the square. So it was a, an LED screen embedded in the model, okay? So that's the square, that it used to be a very active place at the beginning of the 20th century. It used to be the farmer's market. So it was a very kind of economic uh, spot of the city. Then in the 60s, there was this fascination for the cars, so the square became a parking lot. And then in 2010, it was actually a parking lot uh, with a street in between. So, and it only becomes a kind of a public space on the National Day, which is in May. And there is a promenade, a parade that goes uh, through the square and everything else. So I'm gonna... So here you can see how we kind of define the preliminary design. The preliminary design, we produce it in Madrid before going there. So it was with the, all the knowledge you can get through the internet and with no input from the local community, but it was, it was a kind of a fine design. I mean, it was all right, but it actually changed dramatically when we were there and talked to the people. But the, the, the preliminary design was uh, creating these three different atmospheres. So there was the space in between the buildings and then this was the green infrastructure that was this kind of ring allocating all the infrastructure, vegetation, furniture, lighting and so on. And then the space inside was what we call the creative arena and that was a space available, empty space to do any kind of event. 
okay, so it goes on and on. And uh, so these are the different branches of the project. We created the physical lab, which was a pop-up office that we created just in front of the square. And it became our place for meetings and uh, lectures and workshops and so on. We had the digital lab which with different kind of tools. There was the platform. There was also the mobile app to enter ideas for those who were maybe, uh, they didn't want to show up for the workshops. And then the Hammer experience, which was an, an online uh, meeting every Monday, sharing about the project. And then some online workshops and people from different countries attended and provided ideas for it. Then there was the urban actions, which was like kind of low cost, low means uh, actions in the square. And the idea was to kind of provoke the people living there. So we created green hammer, art hammer, paint hammer, film hammer, play hammer, light hammer, and so and cream hammer, which was an action with the students from the Bergen Architecture School, in which they managed to bring a cow into the square. <laughs> and there was a free public lunch for everybody you know, who wanted to show, and I don't know how I'm doing with the time. I'm fine? Okay, maybe I can play this. I mean, there's very little left. Um, so it was a two-day workshop, and the idea was, okay, let's do something in the square because there's still people in the city who doesn't know what's going on, and how can we raise awareness of you know, this transformation? How can we get these ideas? How can we get them together? Uh, because the, the square had been a, a parking lot for 50 years, and it was difficult for them to see that it could actually become much more interesting. Oops, sorry.
Okay, so that was Krim Hammer. Then we had the on-site workshops and lectures that took place in the space, and the idea was always to combine some local expert with someone from um, other part of the world and try to create a kind of a creative dialogue. So we had different people. Then we also created this academic network, and that meant that we partnered up with some other universities, and they took Stotterget, this main public space, as their case study. So there were students working around that. And there is also a program in, Nor in Norway that is connecting creative people with kids. So they are the cultural rucksack. So they decided to connect this project with the kids from the schools locally. So there was 1,300 kids working also around the square, producing models and drawings and so on. Then the preliminary design that we already saw. The project was very much on the media, both on the traditional media and also on the digital media. And we like to see how it affected the, the Google search and when you search for network design or for you know, participation process, it, both in, in English and in Norway, Hammer would actually show up very early. And although the participation process was not that long, it still was very active on the internet. So we had a lot of visits from mainly from Spain and Norway, but from many other countries. Also the Facebook and the Twitter accounts and everything else. So the challenge was like, how can we channel all those ideas, more than 400 inputs, into a kind of a final design and try to, to meet everybody's expectations. So we organized and kind of systematized all these inputs into categories. So the idea was to <coughs> design a project, a square that could be as flexible as possible and the elements that we put there should be, should be able to be used in many different ways because actually the, the petitions and the ideas from the people were actually kind of contradictory. I mean, people would ask for playgrounds and then the next person would say, we have so many playgrounds, we need something for the elders. So it was like really, how can we make you know, everybody happy? So the, the, the four elements that we ended up designing was one was the social ring, uh, which is a water feature in the summer and also a skating rink in the winter. But it's also a kind of um, shows or, uh, you know, uh, events venue because the square has got a, nat a natural slope, so this is a kind of a, the stage for, for these events. And also we had the wooden shelter, which meant to become a kind of a space for the, for again, for the markets and to bring some economic activity. And some other, you know, it's also a playground and a place to watch the Lake Mioso, which is just in front of there. Then we have the local mood forest, which is the kind of the digital layer. And then the winter garden, which is <coughs> a space in which we are playing a little bit with the temperature. And because again, here in Norway, the challenge is to get people out of their homes in winter time. And it's not a matter of that the square should be, you know, perform very good, it's that actually the city center is struggling because all the shopping malls, sh you know, kind of uh, around the, the city are really kind of comfortable and easy. So it's about how can we make people to come back to the city center. So these are images and then I'm gonna finish with this <coughs> video that we produced for the Biennale of Venezia that is talking a little bit about this strategy that we called Dream Your City. Dream Your City <coughs> sounds interesting, but what does it really mean? Dream Your City is an innovative way of transforming urban spaces by setting up conditions that stimulate a public debate and generate new ideas, and by connecting local citizens to professional and academic networks worldwide. Is this just another utopian dream? Has anyone tried it yet? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, 
I don't remember the name of the first project, but I do remember the detail where you uh, you talked about um, how year after year the project actually became more profitable as a result of you know buying the energy and then selling it back. How much in general with your projects does um, sustainable finance play a role? And and do you find if it, if it does play a role, is it something that you instigate? Is it something that's often asked for? Um, and does if it does apply, does that detail actually help you to win jobs? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it has to be, you know, it has to be within the budget, and that's something we have always to struggle with. Uh, but uh, but all, otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. You know, I wouldn't convince somebody to do something really expensive, or you know, or ex you know, compared to a kind of a conventional project, because I think, you know, I don't have the power to convince anybody like that. So mm -hmm. that's the, you know, it's a kind of an attitude. Mm -hmm. So the struggle uh, that we have, you know, or the fight we have to do always is to, you know, to get it in, in, in within the price, mm -hmm. which I think it is difficult, not, not because what we do is more expensive, but probably is done in a way that is not kind of the most conventional. So sometimes, you know, the, con the, the contractor, you know, he's like, no, that I've never done it like that. I don't want to try. I don't want to take the risk because, you know, it's different. And then if we do it and, and we succeed because, you know, we, we are there to, to, you know, to support him and to try to succeed because that's our job, mm -hmm. and then there's not a problem. I, I would say that, the, the, you know, the, the most struggling part is to convince, you know, to do things in a different way. And, and in that case, the, the first project, the Vallecas project, um, it made sense because, you know, there's a lot of sunlight in Madrid. And we are aware of how difficult it is for cities today to keep and maintain everything. And we, you know, and it's very difficult for us to convince a city if we are going to kind of create a problem. So we, we, you know, we're the first ones to try and to avoid it, which is, of course, a challenge. I mean, I'm not saying we have the solution, but we, we very much care not only about the construction part, but also about the follow-up part. We always say there should be some kind of money allocated for that because, you know, we want to know how we performed. Mm -hmm. And sometimes us professionals, we deliver a, a job or a project and we don't know how the building is functioning and so it should be, there should be some kind of follow-up work okay. in order to get some information and to learn, you know, from that experience and in order to avoid future problems. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I see that a lot of your projects uh, range from scale to from smaller scale to the bigger scale, like uh, Dream Hamar. What are some of the challenges in um, trying to include the communities at this bigger scale? You've already mentioned some of them, like the government willing to, you know, extend the timelines and things like that. But what are some of the things that you found challenging and that you maybe learned in this project and will take to future projects that are in similar scale? Mm -hmm. Well, the challenge is to get people activated. I think, uh, and I wouldn't say that is in Norway, not in Spain. I think that's kind of a common trend. I mean, it is difficult to get people engaged because, uh, first of all, because we are, our, I mean, the first is like, how can you convince people that their word is going to be, you know, it's going to actually condition the, the final solution? So you have to have some kind of, uh, temp, you know, time. Um, uh, a good timing for it because if it is, you know, when you are asking people about something that is going to happen in 30 years, you know, people don't care. If it is something that is going to happen, like kind of immediately, I mean, you, you feel more engaged. And then at the same time, you have to find, we are trying to develop tools, you know, good tools to communicate with the society because for years, architects, you know, we communicate to each other fine. I mean, we, you know, we can show sections and drawings and we understand, but we have to find you know, the best way to communicate to the rest of the society because otherwise we're failing. I mean, we, we have a, you know, I have the feeling we have a social role and so if we don't create this kind of conversation of debate, you know, it's, it's sterile. I mean, we are producing in the, you know, especially, especially if we are producing public space. I mean, you're doing the kind of the best public space ever for the people, you really have to listen to them somehow. You know, I'm not saying I've got the answer. Or, or that is an universal answer. It will, you know, th there should be different possibilities, but somehow you need some kind of feedback from the people. So we always also think that, you know, uh, in addition to what I answered to the previous question, there shouldn't be not only money maybe for the, you know, for the kind of afterwards, but also for a preliminary work. It's like, can we test the public space or can we test, you know, with low means the solutions before spending so much money into it? 
because it can, you know, I come from Spain and there's been a lot of infrastructures and things done in the last 20 years and some of them are functioning very good but some others are not and it's really shocking to see that, you know, a public space that was, you know, I don't know how many millions, they didn't take, you know, the time to actually test it a little bit before putting all that money in there. So, yeah, uh, and we are testing, you know, and uh, the different contexts require maybe different channels. The idea is to try to develop different channels targeting different kind of people because it's not the same to engage the youngsters that the professionals or the kids, I mean, there's, you know, I uh, was just wondering, uh, y your projects, at least the first two, are very inexpensive, they seem. And I just was wondering the cost, uh, just sort of the role that uh, the recession has had on you guys in terms of really forcing you to think through ways of saving money and also incorporate, I I'm just kind of wondering, has that pushed you in a certain way or, or sort of what role has that had? Well, as I was saying before, we're very um, we're very used to, to you know to fight to get the most for the less. I mean, that's a, that's the spirit, and that's the way it should be anyway, or in our context, but I think everywhere. And uh, and for that reason, we usually try to use systems that are already there. And also, again, regarding uh, energy sustainability, you know, sometimes it may be a bit a bit more expensive to go into a kind of a more sophisticated system for heating a building, for instance, but probably it will pay off, it will pay back because you actually are gonna be saving money in the next 30 years. So I think it is also important to have the whole picture, not only the instant investment, which is very important, of course, but also the maintenance and, and, and how much you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, to keep a building active, how much it costs. And sometimes, you know, cities are always, usually worried about today, not, they don't care so much about 20 years, but we have to do the numbers. It was a, a very nice presentation. I, I think one of the interesting things about the way you are presenting your practice and your work is that you are revealing a lot of things about the way the projects happen that are often invisible in the way that architects, architects and other designers communicate about the development of complex projects. but. So there are a lot of invisible things around the process of engagement, around uh, even things like finance that you've, you, you've revealed. But I want to talk a little bit about the visible things because you introduced um, your practice by talking about your uh, emerging in the 1990s during a period of great uh, fascination with formal invention and, and with the, let's say, the uh, original language of architecture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and ask you what, you know, the, any architect or any designer does have a, a language often that one works with. And there, there, there is a, um, let's say, a research or a pattern of design in your projects where, for example, there's often the buildings have a kind of triangulated structure. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the public spaces have a kind of um, circular logic. And this repeats. So it's, it, so it's interesting to me that you actually do have a vocabulary that you're working with um, that, that evolves from one project to the next, but, that's, but you don't actually talk about, talk about that so much. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I wonder if that's, a, 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 how conscious that is uh, uh, and how, and, and whether you think you could account for the way in which your own program of research on the form of buildings and the form of uh, the shaping of open space is affected by these uh, elaborate strategies of engagement that you that you emphasize so mm -hmm. much. Okay. Yes, I didn't go into the shape so much because yeah. I really, you know, it, it, for for me, mm -hmm. it's a kind of a, a, it's a, um, it's the solution. It's not a, you know, it's not something like done uh, before. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have been, uh, and I like this, you know, this remark about the nineties because everything was about shape at that time. You know, nobody would care about the energy even or like, you know, it's, it's so obvious now, but it wasn't at that time, okay? And, um, well, that is, of course, we have, we have been trained as architects, and we, you know, there's some aesthetic learning and, 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 con and concern, absolutely, yes. But uh, we very much 
for instance, we very much work to cooperate with the engineers as, as part of our team. And that means that, for instance, the energy performance of a building is just as important as my wish is it to be like this or like that, so or even more. And we, we really try to come to the most efficient solutions that we can. And sometimes you find that it's not that easy in terms that sometimes it is difficult to find engineers that are ready or willing to work in that way because the, the usual way to go is like, you know, as an architect you do a draft or a design and then somebody with, will, you know, estimate the structure and the engineering, I mean all the engineers, and there's not this kind of loop communication. And, and it's shocking because sometimes they say, you know, you just tell me how you want it and I, I calculate it. It's like, I don't want to go like that way. You know, I want to do the most efficient within these parameters. Let us work together. But of course, that's more work than just yeah, assuming that this is it. And sometimes you find, you know, you find yourself a bit frustrated because, uh, you know, it's difficult to find people who are, you know, on the same track than you and they really want to put all that time in order to make it as efficient as possible. So, yeah, I would say that really, and for instance, we have worked very much with textiles and light structures, and there is, you know, there's, there's some implications of that. Uh, the textiles are kind of very low cost, and at the same time, they provide a kind of a climatic conditioning of the building, for instance, in the pre-kindergarten, which, which makes the, that facade extremely efficient because that, those awnings can be open or closed depending on the time of the year. So you can have a very exposed fascia, 700 square meters fascia in the winter time to allow as much sunlight as possible, but then in the summertime it's completely protected. And that is something, you know, we, we like textiles, we liked also this metallic uh, structure because we, we like this kind of dismantability kind of property that you really feel that at some point it can be dismantled and it can be recycled into something else. So of course we do have our kind of obsessions, but uh, but we try not to be just uh, you know guided by our obsessions, but more about efficiency. But you did you did interestingly say when you were talking about the first project, the um, the sunshades, that there was an important rhetorical function to the use of recycling materials, and there was uh, there was a kind of uh, a common thread through some of the built structures and the pavilions where they did where the roofs would have, they appeared to be green roofs, but they weren't all planted roofs. But they're, they're, it's a roof that actually often has the quality of landscape. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, is it the case that sometimes they actually, where the climate is right, they are, and where the budget allows, they are performing green roofs, and other times they play, would play a more rhetorical function mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, no, I mean of course we love also things to be beautiful. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. that's the end yeah. of it. Yeah. But we believe it's more beautiful if it is very well performing. I mean, otherwise it's like, it's a kind of a lie, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like a, and of course we, you know, for instance, uh, with the wind generators, as a very easy example. We were working with the engineers and at some point it was very, it was very well, it was the same efficient, you know, with this shape and with that shape. And, you know, it was very, very the same. So at that point, of course, there is some designer working and say, oh God, but this is much more beautiful. And it makes more sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I, I'm interested. Um, how much input do you do into these uh, workshops when you go to the city? And secondly, how do you test them with the people around? I understood you make kind of uh, uh, installations uh, with the with the. Uh, then you take it home to, to Madrid and do the actual design. But is there, is there anything that you do with the people, the designing with the people? Mm -hmm. Well, the idea was um, not so much to ask them about, you know, they didn't have to draw, per se. I mean, it was about more creating a kind of um, awareness about the transformation of the space and also, you know, to talk about the stories, about their expectations, you know, one of the, we invited kind of in external guests, so we were not conducting the workshops, it was someone else, but they, you know, and each of them uh, had a different kind of methodology, but sometimes it was about like, what do you want to do? You know, don't tell me how you want it to look like, but what would you like to do in the public space of your city? 
And so they, they, you know, they organized some elements and they started playing and they have to kind of perform or act. You know, each, each guest has had a different methodology. Another one w organized the people in teams and they had to, you know, collect their memories of the space and it was about discussing them. So it was not so much in, s in a very direct way, like, you know, what do you want? Just write it down and then discuss it. It was more a kind of a very, very creative atmosphere. But in the end, there was a lot of topics, you know, uh, emerging uh, of how people felt about the space. But for instance, for the kids, that was very kind of a straightforward. It's like, you know, you have to draw your dream to square. And it was very funny because the square and the city of Hammer is just in front of a huge lake that is like 100 kilometers long. And it becomes frozen in the winter as it comes over here, I guess. And people can skate there. For it, but it was shocking to see that the kids were claiming for a skating rink. And he was like, why do you want a skating ring? You have this, the Miosa just there. And people say, yeah, we want to have a more urban experience. You know, we, had, we want to skate, but in the city. Uh, which was very, you know, it was something we had never thought from Madrid. You know, it's like, uh, so actually, you know, this, this water feature, it really, it was very present in every activity and uh, it ended up as a circle because it was the most efficient and it looked all right in the square. And, but uh, there was, they really impacted the design. It was not, um, if, if the design was only produced by us in Madrid, it would have been a totally different. It would have been the preliminary design. It would have been all right, but very different. So I think it, would, it wouldn't be so right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much for your talk. Um, something that I found really inspiring, this is more of a comment, was, um, I feel as though the work is making a really powerful commentary about citizenship and identity as being, as privileging a consumer status where we exist in the city to consume the city, to experience the city in a very passive way. And I think the work is quite radical in how, although it, it has cuteness to it too through the video work and, and even some of the illustrations of the work, but I think it's masked, um, it's more radical maybe than it appears. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm provoking that there is more radicality in the work than may be uh, initially apparent because, uh, because of this tendency towards a consumer status as a citizen. Also, I think another word I found, uh, I kept kicking around in my head when you were presenting was this idea of curating the city, that maybe it wasn't so much about designing the city or even social design, but really setting up curatorial uh, experiences for citizens to conceive of new cities or micro cities. And um, yeah, I found that really uh, refreshing and I feel it's quite original take on uh, urban design, which usually is caught up in bureaucracy and uh, set up different platforms and layers of agreement. And it seems as though the work is also challenged by that kind of confrontation. But um, anyway, this, this idea of um, a non-consumer city and a, uh, a curation is something that, that comes to mind in seeing the work. So thank you very much for your talk. Welcome. Uh, definitely, I mean, you, decide, you explained it very well. Uh, it's about uh, citizen ownership and it's about empowerment. And we live in an era that we really can do a lot of things. It's just, I mean, we do have kind of different tools today that 30 years ago and that enables us to be more active in many different ways. One of the things that we really enjoyed in Hammer, for instance, is that we were only there, you know, I was, I was living there for four months and, and we had an, an office, we had people, I mean, it was, it was very active, extremely active because we had to work both in Norwegian and English and, you know, both uh, digitally and physically and both in Madrid and Norway. I mean, it, it was a challenge. Uh, but one of the things that we enjoy the most is that by, by the time we were kind of almost done there, there it started to, to really feel that people were becoming kind of active and they would show up it's like you know this is great i want to do an activity i want to do this i want so and actually you know it, it's kind of our legacy you know it's, it's beyond defining the urban design there, there was a community that was kind of activated because of this and that's you know i must say that i think that's very important and up to the point that even if it was a very small community you know there's not that many people still people live very isolated it's you know in their own private houses in the, in the landscape, which is nice, but they don't get together that much. So because of the activities we organized, there was people who were actually meeting for the first time. And you know, they were like, you know, I, I talked to so many people during these months and somebody was saying, you know, I just arrived in Italy, I've been living there for 20 years. Well, didn't you meet this other person who was all 
no, I never met him. He's like, I can't believe it. You know, I come from Spain. I'm introducing you. He's like, so there was, it was a huge social kind of hub. And there was a lot of people who were saying, actually, there should be a space like this for always, you know. But what I mean is like, and I, again, about this kind of curatorship, I also think we, we are designers, which is great, but I think we should also kind of learn a kind of mediator or curator kind of work. Because, you know, I think this, there has been a lack of fluent and efficient communication be between architects and urban designers and the society. And I think that's terrible because somehow it's damaging our work. And, you know, people think, well, architect, why, why would you hire an architect? We have to kind of, for, from my perspective or from European perspective, I don't know how it is here so much, but, you know, there's this kind of lack of very good communication that enables us to be really important and to provide solutions that are really needed. And so, well, that's, uh, we're, we're trying to do that somehow.